so, um, great. So what we want to do tonight is just hear a bit about yourselves and then God's dealings with you. That's the thing, as I said to you uh, earlier on today. So, first of all, so since you've got the microphone share, and it's ladies first. Thank you. Okay. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about, so for people, especially for people, who, as I say, forget the fact that a lot of people have known you for a while. There's plenty of people here that don't. So where did you grow up and what was growing up like for you? Uh, you know, sort of up to your sort of like teenage years, yeah. sort of things like that. Well, okay, well, I was born in Edge Hill, and um, we lived in a flat in Hayton. I can't remember that because I was only a baby. And then we moved to Rain Hill when I was about four. And um, I've got, I'm the eldest, and I've got a brother, Mike, who's Three years younger than me. Carry yeah. on, I'm just going to alter this. Go and a sister, Philippa, who's four years younger than me, and a sister, Ruth, who's five years younger than me. And um, we all, as children, came to this church only because Claire Ash's auntie, Janet, brought me and my brother and sisters here as children. And when we came here, it was only a wooden hut. How old are you then? Was it? Like I was about four or five. So about hundred some, years ago. That's very good. So, so you're about four or five. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, I can't be. Yeah, I know. Precise. I mean, you, yeah, you're not. Con you know, you yeah. don't know your age. Do you? So, but well, then um, we had trouble at home because my dad was an alcoholic, and it wasn't easy at home at all. Um, but. Praise God, um, in the future years, my mm -hmm. mum did come to give a heart right. to Jesus. So how old were you then when that happened? This quite a long time after all. Um, I was probably about 16 or something, perhaps when my mum came to church. Yeah. Because she didn't bother, they just sent us along, you know, my mum and So dad. where did you go to school? Did you go to school in Rangel? I went to school at Longton Lane. Longton Lane, just up the road, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Longton Lane and School. The school hasn't changed a bit since, they still talk about you. And oh I yeah, I know, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that for Sharon's church you, you're about to stay there? Oh, oh, and they just threw the face up, I don't know what that's all about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then I went to, um, well it was called Rainhill High School now, yeah. but it was secondary school up at the top of Tuba Lane, which is now houses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, stop in there for a minute. I'll yeah. pass it on to Eddie and we'll okay. catch up with him. So, Eddie, uh, I guess a slightly different upbringing. Is that going to be? Yeah, there's plenty of them. Loads of like there. Right? So, uh, what about you? Early years, where were you? How did you, you know, um, where did you live? What did you do? School and that sort of thing? Well, I was born um, down in Toxteth. Uh, you'll get some Christians who'll tell you how they've had a really life changing moment of salvation from drugs, drink or whatever. Um, I've never had that. I've been more, I don't know, for want of a better expression, sort of a middle class type Christianity conversion and brought up in that way. Um, but when I was born, we were actually in a one bedroom room on the top floor of a house in Toxteth with um, mum, dad, me, sister, and a communal bathroom. So we were really poor. Me, mum would have two jobs going on at once, and my father was in the Navy. Now, my sort of ancestry is from, on my dad's side, from Nigeria. Granddad, for some reason, came over here and had a fight in the war. Um, before passing on. So from that sort of time, I was about two, when we actually got a bedroom between me and my sister in a two bedroom house, uh, moving up to Kirby, which is where I was brought up. Uh, I went to school there and um, secondary school. And I really enjoyed that time because it was great to have even though I shared to have a bedroom. But we went sort of a little bit better because my dad got promoted in the Navy and they had a bit more money and I didn't have to sort of worry about getting presents or anything like that. In fact, when my dad came back from places like Mombasa, uh, I was the one in the street with the toys. 
And I remember going down our street with one of those little mechanical robots which was walking up alongside of me. Uh, nobody else had that, but uh, I did, and people were obviously being jealous of it. Um, I don't know why, but I ended up going to church. Um, I can remember... Was that in Kirby? You went for that was in Kirby. When, yeah. Sorry, we moved to, yeah, when I was about two. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I ended up in church in Kirby Baptist. I don't know why, because nobody in our family was a Christian. But my mum's sort of from a Catholic background. My dad's from C of E. So how old were you when you started going perhaps to, to Kirby Baptist? Because you'd be quite young, I guess, would you? Really? I was very young. Yeah. I, I've got vivid recollections of going down to a school in probably the summertime for the church party, because <laughs> there's quite a lot of us uh, having fun and games in the school. Um, I know that was actually from Kirby Baptist, but... I left there and went over to the CV church in Kirby and was brought up through Boys Brigade then for a few years and eventually returned back to um, Kirby Baptist. Um, the reason I went back to Kirby Baptist was the fact that I was walking with a friend of mine, John, just after we started in secondary school at the age of 11. And as we walked past, he said he was going to the church tonight to play football. And I asked uh, if I could go to play football. He said, you can't. He said, you can only come on a Thursday to play football if you actually come on a Sunday for the, what you probably remember as Covenanters. So next Sunday, I ended up at Covenanters. <laughs> I was only 11 at the time, and you were supposed to be there um, 12. Now, I can't remember whether I lied about my age or whether I just didn't tell them. But I ended up there, and it was probably the November, about five weeks before my 12th birthday. Um, they eventually found out, but <laughs> they didn't mind. So, so right, so back, back, to, back to share again now. So you're kind of getting to teenage years. You, you've come, and you've already started coming here. Mm -hmm. So, what was this place like when you came to it? Because it'd be interesting for people to know who haven't been here. So, yeah. you said it was like a wooden hut and everything like that. But so, yeah. what was it like in terms of who came here and right. how many? Okay. People? Um, well, there was Covenanters here as well because Covenanters was like um, Big youth a Christian organisation for lads and girls. So the lads would meet in the vestry, what it was there, and the girls would meet in the hall. And Janice and Eric Smith were our leaders and. Norma and Morris Lee were our leaders yeah. as well. And then um, also prior to that, they had an R club here. An and, R club, an R club. And they club R, R, R for Ruth. Oh, they right had then. an R club. And there used to be tons of kids coming, be singing and learning loads of stuff about Jesus. Mm. And that's how they just, there was just tons of kids that come. Yeah. But I got, uh, I went to Duco's first, which is Junior Covenanters. Yeah and then to Covenanters, and as a group, the girls, would you believe, we won, didn't we, Sheila? <laughs> Us girls from the Rain Hill Trinity Church won the um, singing contest. You're joking. Yeah, and we went to London, we went to London. To you sing. went to London to sing. The, the Covenanter <laughs> girls group went to London to sing, right. and one of the songs went what? like this. Oh no, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk. You were singing on Saturday. Yeah, go on. I, I was the answer. Go on, yeah, go I was on. The You've got a microphone, you may as well use it. Go it went on. like this. <laughs> There's a river of praise within my heart, which is flowing full and free. For Jesus Christ came down from heaven. He died for you and me. And it went on like that. That's the nicest <laughs> I've ever heard of this. The microphone, would not it? I can imagine, mate. Right? Well, we were trying to paint here on Saturday and all we got, and we all went home with, what was it? Uh, what was that song you were singing on Saturday? It was, just, it was an earworm one, yeah. We, we were all singing it for the rest of it. Anyway, anyway go on, so we, we, we went off to uh, London, but we didn't win the ball. Didn't you? No, but it was a, a we, wonderful we time. Well. <laughs> you know, it was a wonderful we time, the, um, <laughs> our teenage years. So, that, so that, that's great in its own. Again, so over to Ed for now. Okay, so we'll keep swapping it over. 
So Ed, you, you're, a, you're at Kirby Baptist now, your teenage years. Now, you first then, when did you start to get ser serious about God? Was it that time or were you a lot older when you really started to take it a bit more seriously and think about what it was? I can't remember what year it was, but I started off um, 12 and the guy who did it, Derek Robinson, lovely guy, um, he had four groups and it was Romans, Medes, Persians and Greeks and you were put in one of the groups. And they used to obviously tell you about their Christian matters from scripture every Sunday. Um, it was either, I think it may have been the first year I asked if I could go to camp and mum foolishly allowed me to. And I actually went to cricket for North Wales. Um, we used to have a padre who used to give a short um, story each night. And in the middle of the week, one of the things he was saying was, we need to accept Christ as our saviour. And I felt at that time that I wanted to. And we went off in a separate tent, there was quite a group of us. Um, he spoke to us a few more minutes and we all gave our lives to Christ on that night. So you'd be about 12 then, should say something like that, yeah? Would have been probably um, towards 13, I think. Yeah. Um, that was the first time, because my life changed as a person, um, probably for the better a little bit, but it didn't last that long because I remember, and I still remember the guy's name, Jeffrey Hemmings from school, and he was the same age as me, a little bit heavier, with book teeth. <laughs> and one of the things he used to do was wind me up because at that time there was a lot of racism and some of the comments he made were racist. And after a while, I'd had enough and um, hit him. And I still remember on my knuckles having the indents from his book teeth. <laughs> um, but the next year, um, I actually went back to the camp and um, I rededicated myself then. And that's where my life did change. Um, I started reading more. I started behaving better. And I was enjoying the sort of life as a Christian. And when I was 17, before I actually went on to my employment, I actually got baptised at Kirby Baptist, um, which was something that I can still vividly remember all those years ago. So what was it, what was it, what was it like in school being a kid, because you were you know, kind of a kid as a Christian in school? Was, I mean, you mentioned so many, some people making comments, but it was more about the race thing, wasn't it? But was it, did, it, did you get picked on about being a Christian or anything like that, or not much really? No, um, I was fortunate because most of the kids in the church, in the group, actually went to my school. So there was quite a lot of us in that sense. We didn't have a Christian union or anything like that, because in those days you didn't. But I don't remember anyone making any observations, because in those days, it was unusual for people not to have some church background. Mm, yeah. um, your grandmother would go to church, drag their children along, then as they grew up, they would drag their children along. Send um, them. Sorry? Send them. Or send them, yeah. They'll drag in most cases. <laughs> but um, nowadays, you don't do that. Like, you talk about Jesus Christ to a child, it just looks like you can think, what the heck is that? You know, so in those days I did, but I can't understand why I went to church in there in because I was the only Christian in there, as it turns out. So he wanted to play football? Well, that was that was to the second church, but I don't know why in the first instance. I haven't got a clue. Okay, Cher, back to you again then. Um, so when did when did it start to become more, because obviously you're enjoying the Jucos and all that, and then the Duke, the Covenanters, um, a bit more serious well, for you then? What do you think I don't it? exactly remember the days, <coughs> but I do remember... <coughs> I was still in Covenanters, I'm probably about 13, 14, and we had a guy come to speak, Alan, somebody, I can't remember his surname, but he came to speak at a special Covenanters meeting in the church. Okay. And he was talking about <coughs> Jesus and about what you have to do to become a Christian. And I just felt I should go forward and find out more about this. And there was a, a small group of us afterwards, we went down to the front 
and this guy Alan, I can't remember his name, he spoke to us and he gave us a journey into life book as well and I remember going home and in my own time, in my own bedroom, reading the journey into life and going down on my knees and asking Jesus to be my friend, you know, take away all the rubbish that I've done already. And that was when I started to become more serious about Jesus. How old did you say you were then? When about 13, 14, yeah, so something like that. Yeah. And I wanted to tell others about, you know, like yeah. friends from the back over there and mm -hmm. friends in school. You know, I, yeah. I was wanting to witness and wanting to read my Bible more as well. So tell us about home then. What was it like when you went home then to tell Because you did tell anyone at home, like you, your mum and your brothers and all that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I remember. I don't remember telling my mum and dad then. But a couple of years down the line, we went, Morris took us to some other church over the water, and we went to watch a film called Thief in the Night. Ooh, and that was about when Christ is coming back. And I thought, do you know, I don't know whether I'm going to be ready. And I remember then going to the front again and rededicating my life because I thought, there's no way I'm going to be ready when Jesus comes out. I'm just not right enough. So then, after that, meeting over the water i come back and my mum and dad were in the living room and i told them what i'd done i said look i've accepted jesus i believe him and i want to live for him and they were just like they didn't say much really to be fair but life just went on as normal and i just kept you know reading my bible and praying i, I always remember praying so much because at home it wasn't easy with my dad he, he sort of wanted us to leave really he wanted us to get out he didn't i didn't have a good relationship with my father and so much so that when he'd go out drinking of a night time and he'd come back i'd be thinking oh please lord keep me mum safe i'd be frightened that he was going to hit her or kill her i just I had these vivid vivid imagination, everything knows has got a vivid imagination, but I'd be praying to you, Lord, keep us safe, because I was thinking he's going to get the scissors and kill her. Mm -hmm. These things, that I, yeah. but I still pray to God, you know, I, I just knew he was there, and I just knew, yeah. you know, he was there to help. Good. So, um, moving on then, so you, you, you kind of, you stay with you, so right, yeah. So, so um, you're, you're at home, you're sort of still in your teenage years, then we move out into the work world and things mm -hmm. like that and moving on from that. So how did that go for you as a Christian going into work? Chain, all the changes in life are big moments for Christians, aren't they? Just getting yeah. you know, new friends. So just tell us, talk us through that. Right, one. well, I was um, 16 in the high school and <laughs> I wanted to be a ship hostess. <laughs> you know, anyway, Why not? Why that, not? that didn't happen. The careers teacher put me off. But anyway, I was um, good at short hand typing and I ended up in the printers in Prescott right. doing <coughs> typing, not short hand, basically a dispatch clerk. And there I was able to witness to others about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So much so, my friend Sue Hudson who was working there and she comes here now, I was able to tell her about Jesus. And years down the line, she gave a heart to mm. Jesus. So it was hard in work. I used to get laughed at, you know, um, but I carried on, you know what I mean? I carried on trusting yeah. and praying, you know, no matter how hard it was. What about you, ex So you're moving out now, should you end the school career, what are you gonna do? And how did it go for the transition for you? Um, it went okay for me because I haven't been baptised when I was 17 at Kirby. Um, I managed to persuade my mum to come and she was horrified. I, this is just on the side, but I actually went to the baptismal pool which was at the front and I was stood there in my t-shirt and jeans and I learned afterwards she was criticising me for being such a scruff. <laughs> she didn't understand that the jeans and the t-shirt I had on were gonna get wet and needed changing. She expected me to turn up in my best suit. And, um, but she turned up, my dad was away in the Navy. But with him, I either wanted to join the Navy or become a policeman. 
um, he persuaded me with regards to the Navy and actually advised me about the trade to go into of radio electrics on aircraft. So in September the 26th, 1972, I ended up joining HMS Raleigh in Plymouth. Now our pastor at the time, um, Jim Pollock, he actually gave me the address of the Baptist Church in Plymouth. So when I got down there, I actually had some contact information for the church to go to, which I didn't go much, but I was able to make contact with them. And so I had Christian uh, contacts there. I spent six weeks there before going off to Portsmouth. And Jim again um, gave me some more contacts. And I ended up going to Fairham Baptist Church. I actually met a chief who was actually on one of the ships there and he introduced me to um, a couple, Joe and Mike, who actually run the Naval Christian Fellowship. Now the Naval Christian Fellowship is an organisation for the benefit of the sailors and any Christian who is open to it would join the organisation and they produce a list. So whatever ship I go on, I can look at this list and see all the Christians there and make contact. So I always had the encouragement throughout my naval career of being in touch with other Christians. Um, all because of the fact that I started off with the pastor from my old church there. So I've always been that way inclined. and I don't think I was a Bible basher, but yeah. I, I obviously witnessed and I was always going to church. Um, so much so that the Padre actually asked me to read in front of some of the senior officers from the base one Sunday, um, which is a good contact point, and so everybody knew. Um, when I actually later on went to a raft base, our mess was actually opposite the bar, and whenever I went in for a coke or something like that, people realised that. Um, once or twice people tried to spike my drink but I always knew and um, instead of the lads laughing at it I know one of the lads they actually grabbed hold of the drink and poured it down the back of the trousers <laughs> of the lad who did it because they were fed up with him doing it because they knew and respected me one night the window got broken and the guy in charge of the block went round and woke every single person up in the block to check the hands to see who'd done it. But he didn't wake me up because he knew I wouldn't have even been over there at that time and I wouldn't have done it. Um, and I obviously give God the credit for that. So did you have any, like obviously having the, the, the fellowship there and, and the sort of the, the people on board that you knew, um, apart from, you, obviously did, you just said about some of the uh, stupidity and antagonism that you would have got, but did you have much from that at all in the Navy or was, did you find it, did, you know, what sort of opportunities does that give you to sort of, for faith and, and to, to speak about it or whatever? I think most of the um, time of, worship, of um, witnessing were more so on one of the big ships, HMS Ark Royal. I'm not talking about the one that came in um, the 1980s, I'm talking about the 1950s one which is still going in uh, the 1970s when I joined. I actually went to Rio de Janeiro and I wanted to find a church, a Church of England church, to go to, which was in the um, leaflet from the Naval Christian Fellowship. I had to find someone who spoke English and they all speak Portuguese over there. The only place I could find for someone to speak in English was actually in Lufthansa Airlines. So I had to go in there and I asked them, and it just so happens German speaking English, speaking Portuguese, and they actually directed me to where I needed to go. When I walked in, I was so shocked because there was half a dozen people there that I recognised, all from the ship. I had no idea that they were Christians, but they'd all had the same idea We'd all gone down to this place and we all had a great time of fellowship. So to actually meet Christians there, that in a sense was when I developed as a Christian with other Christians. 
Um, I was able to witness, and I remember one young man, Robbie, he confessed to me that he'd actually been with a young lady at the night um, on one of the ports and perhaps got something he shouldn't have done. And he was very upset because he was married and he was wondering what to do. And I explained to him that he's got to be honest, he's got to be open, and she deserves to know. Anyway, but the last night the um, wives and parents and that came aboard the ship before we sailed into harbour. And he actually told her and she forgave him on the spot. Um, even years afterwards we were friends and he was really grateful. When I got married, just going a little bit further ahead, I was mid-sharing. I've been married probably about three or four years and I got an email of someone. Um, he said, are you the Eddie that used to be in charge of my mess deck? Because he remembers me being a Bible basher. <laughs> and that's his words, not mine. And he just wanted to explain to me that all those years of me telling him about the Lord had now had an effect and he'd become a Christian. And that was something that I never thought about, but I was just being a Christian. I didn't go out, didn't get drunk, didn't go out with the ladies. And Sundays, I would go down to the chapel and have the Sunday service on the ship with other Christians. And that, I think, was the start of me as a Christian witnessing. Right. Great. Cher, sure. so how did you two get together then? Come on, tell me, this, tell us the story. Have you got a week? No, no, just, just briefly tell us the story. Right, okay. Um, yeah. she, she started this. Oh, I, I, that's why I gave her my turn. <laughs> right, I was always nervous when it come to boys and men. I only had about four boyfriends, which didn't, they weren't Christians. However, I was getting up to like going up to 30, though, Lord, please, can't you just give me a decent Christian man? Can't you supply me with a Christian man? And I used to, when I lived on my own in my own house, I used to come home from work and I used to go on the landing in my little house and I used to cry and pray to God, Lord, please, can I not have a Christian husband? And lo and behold, he did supply me with one. But it didn't hit me straight away. Because Eddie, when I first met Eddie, he probably doesn't remember this, but I do. I was dressed up as Saltina, the singing songbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on the stage here right. <laughs> in this church. We have a stage there. And um, I spotted Eddie thought, oh, he's nice. <laughs> and you know, remember the program starts in Hutch? Well, they had one of them cardigans that Starsky used to wear, the cream cardigan with the black zigzag on the back and the belt round. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, I like him. Yeah. But was lovely to be fair, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Never saw him again. He wow. was in the audience. But what happened was Neil Atherton instigated you coming because Eddie was a leader at cricket at the camp and some of our lads from here used to go there and they invited Eddie. Anyway, cut a long story short, he used to come to church and I'd see his car outside and I'd be like shaking and thought, oh, he's here. And then my palms would be sweating. I'd feel physically sick. Honestly, I was a bag of nerves. And then um, <clears throat> one night, we used to go as, a, as young people to somebody's house somewhere and we call it squat. Um, but this night, Eddie was at church and they were going off somewhere, the young people, but I wasn't going for some reason. I can't remember why. But there was another girl, Karen Williams, and Eddie was chatting to her, and I was thinking, she's not long since finished with her boyfriend, and I've got nobody. And I was feeling really sad for myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that night, I was, I was at home making me sandwiches for work the next day, and I was crying in my sandwiches, thinking, it's just not fair, God, it's just not fair. <laughs> Anyway, it was the longest story short. <clears throat> he kept coming, and I kept being a bag of nerves, seeing him, blah, blah, blah. And then one Christmas, um, I was still living at home by this stage, <clears throat> excuse me, and he said to me, oh, are you going anywhere for Christmas Day? I said, well, yeah, I'm going to my mum's. He went, oh, it's okay. And I thought, oh, I wonder if he was going to ask me to dinner, but he never. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone, because I'd probably be sick, I felt sick. 
And then <clears throat> he said to me, do you want to come out with me to my friends tonight? This was Christmas Day. And I went, oh, I'm okay then. <laughs> Panicking. And then he come around tea time. And I'd never, I'd never said like to my dad or my mum, I was going out with someone. I just said to my mum one day, oh, there might be romance in the air. <laughs> but anyway, so, so he come to pick me up and my dad went, who are you? <laughs> and Eddie actually explained, well, I'm taking your daughter out, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's how we sort of got together. Uh, and from then on, it was like, um, I was just dumbfounded that I had this handsome man. Not thinking it was going to come to not marriage. Eddie, not Eddie then, it was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you were, you were waiting for me to say Not it, even we? thinking that, yeah. you know. And so like six months down the line, we were going on a church weekend to Cricketh. Yeah. And, um, you know, the lads were in tents and the girls were in separate tents. Not even an iota in my mind about nothing. And then the, we were dressed up as tramps because the young people were trying to find the leaders and yet they were going around trying to figure out who was, you know, the leaders even though we were dressed as tramps. And Eddie didn't get dressed up as a tramp. But he, we went for a walk. I was a tramp and he was normal. <laughs> <laughs> and he took me down on Cricket Beach. I was actually listening to a sermon with my headphones on from Dougie Atherton. And um, he gets down on the beach in these rocks and he goes, take your earphones off. So he took my earphones off and he went, what do you think about us getting engaged? And I was like, <laughs> what? I, I, I felt physically sick. I thought, oh, I, I, I wasn't expecting. I was like, Eddie, or I, I don't know. I really don't know. And then we'd gone back to the camp and I couldn't eat. I felt physically sick. It was just a reaction that I had because I just was shocked, I wasn't expecting it. Um, anyway, I could go on and on about it, but... <laughs> poor yeah. Edward, poor Edward, I, I, I had him up and down, up and down, because one minute I was and the next minute I wasn't. It was That's just, not like you, Shane. No, I was good. very indecisive. Well, what happened was, he'd gone to my mum and dad first and asked, well, you know, could he be engaged and marry me? And my mum said, well, look, she's very indecisive, you know. <laughs> and he'd gone to my friend, M. Stanhope, and he said, look, I'm going to ask Sharon to get engaged. And she said, she's very indecisive, you know. <laughs> but that's another you story. You said yes in the end, no, did I you? I did in oh, the end. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> that's, that's an even longer story. I know, I can imagine, yeah, yeah. But so, so that's how you don't need to tell me your side of it, because I know we we've heard your side as well, haven't we, really? Well, I will say well, one thing. In 1990, um, my birthday is December the 21st, and I moved a couple of months earlier into the house, which is just around the corner from Sharon. It's a brand new house there. And she used to come round was it after, <coughs> after, after, the night. after the Wednesday night meeting. And we just said hello and had a coffee or whatever she had. And this day, she came round and just gave me a bar of chocolate and a card and asked me what I was doing. And I wasn't doing anything for my birthday, I was just staying in. And it turns out I just stayed in and cleaned the fish tanks because I had a uh, uh, breeding fish. And she ended up afterwards, she joined me doing that. And then afterwards... Well, man's just dead, isn't it? Yeah, that, don't <laughs> she was rubbing um, <laughs> hand cream into my hands. Oh. And then one thing led to another and we had our first kiss. Oh. So that's how it started off. And as she said, when I went round on um, Christmas Eve, or Christmas Day, her dad just looked at me and said, who are you? <laughs> I said, I guess I'm the boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, let's, let's move it on to, up to sort of bring it more, towards more being up to date. So, I mean, really, the thing is, you, you've both been Christians for a long time. You, you've both kind of, um, God brought you two together. Um, tortuously, but he did get his way in the end, so that's a good thing. And, uh, and so you're together, and that's great. But how has God used you over the, over the time? What, what, just give us some examples of how God has worked in your life, each of you, you know, in different ways. Not, you don't, you know, these are things that are just normal things in life, aren't they? But what, what difference does it make for you to be a Christian? And how has God worked in your life? 
And when it comes to you, could you tell us a bit about street pass as well? Because I know you do that, don't you? So yeah. tell us a bit about that. But well, go on, you, you started off at what, 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 what just, just bring well, us up to date, really. When I was still in the Navy, just before I met you, and I actually became the um, midweek fellowship leader. So I would have to organise the midweek meetings and I'd be taking them. So I'd have to do Bible studies each week for it. Um, so I, I did a lot of work like that. So I, I was used to it. And then when I joined the police, I actually was in the Christian Police Association. Um, I actually attended the meetings. I didn't actually take them, which was quite good. And then obviously, um, one of the things that led me to Trinity was sometimes we as Christians forget ourselves and we do things which we shouldn't. And in around about 1985-ish, I was actually stabbed in the back by other Christians. And literally. Not literally, no. <laughs> but what they did to me hurt. And I ended up leaving that church. And I remember in 85 getting a prophecy on me when I was in um, Holland at a church I attended, which basically said along the lines that if you trust in the Lord, I will bring you through all the troubles that you will go through. And I went through a lot of problems then. And in 1990, I went back there. And this time I was going out with Sharon. And I took her with me. And we had the same situation where the church prophesied over each one of us. And I opened my Bible and in it was the translation of what was said to me the first time. And it suddenly dawned on me that what has happened over the last five years was the answer to that prophecy. I had a lot of issues there that I ended up leaving that church. Not so much with Kirby Baptist, it wasn't them, it was actually another church. But I ended up leaving and because I knew Neil Adderton, I came up here. And that in itself, <coughs> leaning on, I actually met Sharon. Um, we got married in 1992. I stayed here because young Mike Adderton, who's sort of Doug's sort of relative, in distant relative there, he said to me as a young person, will you come out to the squash meeting, which was an after church service at people's houses with the young people. And they really made me welcome and acted as though they wanted me to stay. And I stayed because of the love that they had for us. And through there, I've obviously grown as a Christian in Trinity. Um, I've taken services here. I've led midweek meetings here. Um, obviously now getting onto the diaconate. But all through that, I can see that I went through a lot of problems. But because of that bad situation, I was blessed because at the end of the day, I'm now married and haven't been married for 30 years. Mm. Had that not happened, I probably wouldn't have attended Trinity one of these. Mm. So the Lord used it to my blessing. Mm. Great. Share. So um, tell us, you know, just, just bring it up to date in terms of your experience of uh, God working in your life. And then how did you get involved in Street Passes? So what was that all about? What, what's that all about? Yeah. Um, well, one um, crisis I went through was before I was married, actually. I'll just tell you quickly. Um, I had to leave home. I had to leave home. And I ended up getting a little house by myself. And um, I was so... Um, what's the word I'm going to use? So confused about everything. I went to, uh, there, was a, there was a little church in Prescott and there was, they used to have a little shop and it was a Christian bookshop there. And I went in one day and I was just searching for answers to this problem that I had. And I spoke to a lady there and she was like an angel in disguise, she really was. She said, read that book. And it was called Power in Praise by Merlin Carruthers. Wow, that book just spoke to me and it was just saying about whatever situation you're in however hard it is 
praise God through whatever it is you're going through. I started to do that and I saw, you know, how much God can bless you. Once you start praising God in any horrible situation, God will bless you. And I was able to witness to quite a few friends because of that, because of that awful situation I was in. Anyway, um, cut a long story short, I'd gone through all sorts of stuff in my life. And I'd suffered with depression for years, and that is also another, I was suicidal at times, which poor Eddie, I don't know how he put up with me, but he did praise God. So I've always sort of trusted God, you know, because, and he has pulled me through. I know his patience, I haven't got patience, but he's just taught me patience to wait on him, to trust in him, even though I find it hard to trust. The last, like, so many years, I've learned to trust in God and just wait on God because he knows everything, as you said this morning, about the, t the timing, the timing of everything he knows. However, um, praise God, you know, I've got this far, thankfully, through Jesus. And a couple of years ago, we had um, some people come here talking about, excuse me, street pastors. And um, I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be able to uh, reach out and help people. And I like the uniform as well. <laughs> so um, I think, I don't know, whether it was four or five years I've been a street pastor. Yeah, hip for the men in uniform, don't they? I do, yeah. <laughs> anyway, because a long story short. Um, so I became interested in street pastors and then it takes a while to get trained up. It's not difficult, it's just time consuming really. Um, and since becoming a street pastor, it's been marvellous on the streets of St. Helens at one, two, three in the morning, being able to just be there for the homeless, for the girls in the nightclubs and the lads in the nightclubs. On one night we were out on the streets and these four girls come running over, street pastors, street pastors, can you pray for us? So we're outside this club in St. Helens, the candy club, um, praying with these young girls, you know, they just wanted prayer. Can you pray that me and my fellow will be happy for the rest of our lives? I'm like, well, we'll try. <laughs> so we ended up praying for her and then every other girl then wanted to be prayed for. And then a couple of hours down the line, one of the girls come back with the fellow. She went, can you pray for me again and this fellow I've got here? <laughs> so, you know, we meet some um, lovely people. The majority of people are nice. And sometimes where we can, I mean, we're not supposed to really witness, but I love to witness. So where we can and the, the opportunity arises, you know, I may say, look, do you need prayer for anything? And more often than not, they'll tell you what they want prayer for. And, you know, we just say, well, would you like us to pray now? And a lot of them say yes. You know, and so it's just lovely to be able to witness to people and to be able to keep those people in mind. And then we can tell them to other people and other people can pray for them. It's just giving hope in a hopeless world sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. God, well, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great to hear that. Obviously, God is using you both in different ways. There's lots more you could have said, I know that. But, um, but you know, has, has brought you through all sorts of things. But quite ordinary things in many ways, but other things have been different to what other people go through. I'd just like to ask you one more thing, though, because I think it's quite, in, it, not just interesting, so sorry, share. Um, you know, if you don't mind talking about it, it's up to you. You know, when you said the mental health things of being in depression, um, did you ever feel like sort of some people quite often feel well I'm, I'm letting God down here going through all this thing I should be able to come through it yeah, yeah. how did you cope with all of that did, did, you, did you have that or were you just did you, yeah, you get yourself through it well tablets yeah I'm still on tablets yeah, now no, but, but in uh, terms of your spiritual walk yeah well I always you know Eddie I very often have to go to Eddie he was like my counsellor and he'd try and encourage me as much as he could but I when you're in that deepest depression and you just, no matter how hard you try to get out of it, you just can't. And yeah. very often I'd be just crying on my own because it wasn't fair on Eddie. Mm -hmm. And I'd be saying, Lord, why? Why have I had to, why do I have to go through this? You know, and I had to be patient with the Lord. He wasn't going to fix it 
straight away, even but though that I, must have I want, you feel, you must have felt. I did you feel. You wanted it fixed straight away. Yeah, I, I was impatient with God. I yeah. wanted it to be fixed yeah. right away because every second in that lowest part of depression is like hell. Yeah. It is yeah. really. I can't explain it any other way. Yeah, it's it's just the one you wouldn't wish anybody to have it. it would, yeah. Um, but just being trusting in God really and also singing yeah. when I come to when I came to a point where I, I, I didn't want to even be bothered cleaning the house couldn't be bothered getting up but when I eventually did make an effort to do those things I had to really push myself and I would sing songs Christian songs joyful songs even though I wasn't joyful I just sang them and thought right come on you know lifting me spiritual yeah. god help me help me so i'd sing songs and that lifted me up out of it and i'd make myself clean up even though i didn't want to oh, come on you can do it and the more i sang and the more i pushed myself but i know it wasn't me it was the lord as well because i i couldn't have survived without jesus's help i know i couldn't no, it goes through well uh, yeah I literally really in that sense isn't it i know how low you were and because you said to me before but i think i think that that singing through it so it goes back to what you were told about praising through all situations isn't it you know yeah, you forget and, but, you, but, but yeah. sometimes you're not feeling like it and you just have to sing it anyway yeah know, exactly yeah. And that's kind of what you're doing yeah, yeah even you know singing through crying you, 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 and i know now i look back and i think yeah I've had to go through that because yes. I know now how other people feel. I've been able to help so many I'm people, you, yeah, yeah. you know, saying, look, I know what it's like. Because it's I very know. hard, not many people would really understand that. That's no. why I asked you about it, because I know it's, yeah. it's, it, people have got different things, but not many people get to the, the lowest that you, you were being into and everything like that. And um, it's such a hard thing, and Christians it is don't a hard like to talk thing. about it, because it's, it's talked about out there, but sometimes there is this thought, the Christians should never get it, and you should be. Yeah, you, do, you feel guilty. Yeah, you why? You shouldn't do. Yeah, no, no, I know. But at the end, praise God, He's brought me through it, and I just want to be of help to somebody else. So, anybody who wants to talk to me about anxiety and depression, you know, I've got like ideas of how, you know, other ideas. Of, but sometimes it is just sometimes, isn't it? It's, it's more about just know, you know somebody knows, but everyone's situation would be slightly different. I know you can help, but I think that sometimes it is just being alongside someone isn't it really? yeah and if you've been through you know what it feels like so yeah. that's that's you know easy. people when people say snap out of it you no, can't you can't, no. you can't but praise god he's helped me so how would you just i'm like, just, on. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna ask you about that we'll carry on all. it was different for me knowing what sharon was going through because when you love someone you don't want to see them going through a pain that they're going through my prayer was god why don't you heal her and i got in a sense, I suppose I got a bit depressed because he wasn't. But since the incidents that happened, I've seen Sharon tell people about depression. And even when she was bad, she's still talking to people on the phone, trying to help them with depression. I can't tell you what depression feels like. I can tell you how to cope with someone who suffers from depression. And I remember when it, the incidents first happened, I phoned my friend in Somerset, because I was heartbroken. And she explained to me that she suffered from depression. And I never realized how many women suffered from depression until that day. And other people came up to me. And then, over the last few years, men have come up to me as well. And it is a really prolific thing. But one of the problems that I found was that she hadn't kept it to herself. Because when she got really bad, it was her friend who actually said, yes, I know. But I thought, well, why didn't you tell me? Because I didn't know. So I would suggest if you do feel depressed or have issues like that, always talk to someone about it. Because people are not going to laugh at you. They're not going to think less of you. Shane will help you. She'll be only too pleased to. As I said, Shane loves singing. She never stops, even at the most <laughs> inappropriate times. And I remember a couple of years ago, we actually went out to uh, Brimham Rocks, for those that know over in near Skipton. 
And as we walk around the moorlands, around these rocky areas, Shaden, you know what she's like, going through the moors singing the sound of music. <laughs> I kid you not. And towards the end of the walk, um, there's a big rock, and I climbed up one side with Shen, and on the top was this man and woman. And anyway, we started talking to them, and she suddenly looks at Shen and says, that wasn't you singing the sound of music, was it? <laughs> she, she actually heard across the moors Shen singing the sound of music. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, really, um, there's a Bible verse which always, always helps me when I'm fearful. Sometimes I do get very fearful. Um, and it's um, the spirit which God has given to us does not make us timid, but his spirit fills us with power, with love and self-control. And when you just break it down and think of those words, you think, yeah, the Holy Spirit is within us when we ask Jesus to be our friend. And he can help us. Why do I fear? So when I'm feeling very timid and fearful, I remember that verse and I say it over and over and over again until I get excited about it and I think, no, I, you know, the Holy Spirit is with me. I can do this. I can, can. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's just a verse I take with me wherever I go. Okay. Listen, thank you both for sharing with us tonight. Do you want to say thank you to them? Give them a round of applause. Thank you for being with us.